Well, good day, men. Great to have you with us again. This is the last BSF for 2021. I hope you're still enjoying the study of Matthew. I hope it's a blessing to you. It certainly is a blessing and a challenge to me as we continually open God's Word and hear it speak to us. Before we go into the lecture time, because this is the last uh, class for the year, I need to bring some announcements to you. So let me uh, just read to you uh, a few details. First of all, term dates. We are recommencing on Monday, the 31st of January. If you're in a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday group, that means you'll be starting on the 1st or the 2nd or the 3rd of February. But we're starting back 2022, the week of Monday, 31 January. Please put that in your diary. Secondly, when we recommence, we will be BSF Melbourne and Geelong. Plenty of people have been asking, what does this mean for us? I told you last week, we're still working through the details and we've done some of that work. Here's what you need to know. You won't be shifting discussion groups unless you need to or you want to, uh, but we won't be shifting you against your will. Secondly, the school program for Geelong is going to stay online and that will continue that until the end of our Matthew study. That means our original plans to ultimately regather the BSF Melbourne school program uh, has still got hope and I'm looking forward to being able to do that when we can. Thirdly, it means that uh, we will be meeting, uh, we will have, we'll have discussion groups both in Geelong and in Melbourne, uh, and those groups will be able to be accessed uh, physically and online. Uh, so we're committed to uh, con continuing our plan to be a hybrid class, having face-to-face -face options and having online options. Some of you have been asking, uh, when do we regather face-to-face -face again? Andy, it's been too long. I agree, it has been too long. I miss many of you uh, seeing you face-to-face. -face. Talking like this to a camera doesn't, doesn't bring me the same joy as talking to you in person. Our reality is this. At the moment, uh, the rules still restrain us uh, to a group of no more than 50 unless we are willing uh, to vet uh, the vaccination status of people at the door. Uh, we're working through the details of uh, how and whether we will do that. Uh, I am committed to uh, providing uh, options for everyone. Uh, so if, we, if as we regather your vaccination status is going to be a challenge to you attending BSF, we commit to having an online option available for you. Uh, stay tuned, we will announce more uh, ahead of the, the regathering, the start of 2022. Um, but for now, um, stay tuned. Be assured that uh, we want you in our class, regardless of whether that means you need to be online or face to face. And we will have options for you, uh, regardless of what, what your needs are. Lastly, uh, and this is, this is the big one. My BSF is now up and running. Uh, sorry, it's not up and running. It will be available to you on the 9th of December. It's up and running for some of us who are checking data. Uh, so over the break, here's what you can do. You can, after the 9th of December, you can log on to My BSF, the new My BSF. Uh, it's on the same web address, mybsf.org. Use your same email and password that you had before. If your password doesn't work, and for some of us that is happening, uh, just click I forgot my password and you can generate a new password and then you can keep going. Uh, have a look around at the new site. It works so beautifully. Check your details, please. Check your personal details and you can upload them yourself. You can change them. If you've got a new email address, new phone number, new residential address, you can change all that yourself. If you've noticed anything that's incorrect and you can't fix it yourself, please just let us know. Here's an email address that you can use. It's on your screen. bsfmelbournemen at gmail.com. I'll say it just in case you're not looking at a screen. bsfmelbournemen, all one word, at gmail.com. 
That's all I have to say to you in terms of uh, announcements. Let me pray for us and then let's open God's word together. Uh, Lord God, we ask now that you would speak to us through your word. Thank you uh, for the way that it speaks to us in a timely manner, in a relevant manner. Uh, I pray, Lord, that we would be soft uh, to be shaped by the truth of the gospel, uh, by the realities of your kingdom. Uh, And Lord, I pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. When I was a younger lawyer, some time ago now, I was helping a more senior lawyer in our firm with a criminal matter. Our client had been caught driving without a driver's license. The reason that he was driving without a driver's license was because he didn't recognize uh, that the country of Australia had been legitimately established. He chose uh, to ignore the legitimacy of Australia's laws. He honestly, uh, at least at that time, he believed that he didn't have to have regard for the laws of Australia. And so if the laws of Australia were not legitimate, then their requirements were not valid on him. Uh, And so he decided that he was not obliged to hold a driver's license because that was not a rule that was valid, just like any other law that he thought had been passed in Australia. The day came that he was pulled over and asked to produce his license and he was unable. And so he was charged with unlicensed driving and he was brought before a magistrate. When he was in the court, he told the magistrate that he also didn't recognize the legitimacy of the court. And uh, the magistrate offered to defer his case for a couple of weeks and allow him to reconsider his position while he was in custody. Yeah. He sat in jail for a couple of weeks thinking about it. He quickly realized that although although he had chosen to not believe uh, that he was under the authority of the Victorian laws and the Victorian courts, actually he was. In fact, the reality is whatever country you're in in the world, you are subject to the rules and the laws of that place. In this second part of our series in the parables, Jesus tells us parables about the kingdom of heaven. It's a place where Jesus is given his rightful place as ruler, as king. It's a place where Jesus is recognized as king. Jesus is king everywhere, but in the kingdom of heaven, people recognize Jesus as king. And in these parables, Jesus offers insights into the growth of his kingdom, into the value of being in his kingdom, and the responsibilities on us and others to respond to the truth and the reality of his kingdom. In these parables, we are going to see that nothing in this world is more important than Jesus and his kingdom. Nothing is more important than Jesus and his kingdom. So we're going to look at this uh, passage in Matthew 13 in three divisions. First of all, division one, the growth of the kingdom. Secondly, the value of the kingdom. And thirdly, the response to the kingdom. And in each of those divisions, there's going to be two parables. Firstly, the parable of the mustard seed and and also the parable of the yeast. Then the parable of the buried treasure and the parable of the pearl. And then thirdly, the parable of the net or the fish and the parable of the house. What I've described as the the parable of the garage sale. Uh, And so let's start in division one, the growth of God's kingdom. If you have a Bible with you, grab it out uh, and have a look at uh, Matthew chapter 13. We're starting in verse 31. In, in these verses 31 to 35, uh, we've got a pair of parables. Uh, and there are quite distinct similarities between uh, those two parables. First, we have a parable of the mustard seed, which a man takes and he plants. A mustard seed is tiny. It is the tiny little lumps in your whole grain mustard in the fridge at home. That's what a mustard seed is. And although it's a tiny seed, 
when you plant it and it germinates and grows, it grows into a large plant. It grows large enough to even be called a tree. Here's a picture on your screen of a mustard seed. And here's a picture of a mustard tree. It's not an enormous tree. It's not the cedars of Lebanon, um, but it is a tree. Something so small grows into something so big. It, it's even a tree that a bird would fly down and sit on the branches. Secondly, in this set of verses, we have the parable of the yeast. The yeast, a woman takes the yeast and she mixes it into the flour uh, until it is worked through all through the dough. Now we know that when yeast, even a very small amount, is worked into bread dough, that it causes the dough to rise. Here's a picture of what happens when bread dough is uh, has yeast worked into us, it, it rises. A t again, a tiny thing has a very large effect. You know, describe, despite these parables being very short and apparently very simple, there are differing views about their meaning. And, the, and these views are held by Bible scholars, people who have studied the Bible far more than I have and are, have applied far more thought uh, than I have. And since different views can be seen uh, as compatible with the teachings of the Bible uh, and coming still coming out of this parable, uh, Matthew doesn't give us a clear explanation from Jesus about what these parables mean. As a result of all that, it would be unwise to be dogmatic, to be too fierce in your view about what this parable is really teaching. Thankfully, though, each interpretation uh, has an explanation that's helpful to us. So let me take you through the possible explanations or interpretations of these parables and how each one of them can be helpful to us as we seek to follow Jesus. First of all, some people view this parable as a warning about sin. The warning is that when sin is allowed in uh, or is planted, it will grow into something large. It can't be contained. It can't be compartmentalized. It affects everything. Now, there is room for this view. Uh, yeast in the Bible is often described, particularly in the Old Testament, as a picture of sin. And we know that Matthew was writing for a Jewish audience, so that kind of makes sense. In addition, Matthew has just put this parable uh, very cl close following the parable of the sower, where the birds were a picture of the devil uh, and his agents. And here in this pa parable of the mustard seed, we've got birds coming and perching in the branches of the tree. The lesson here would be that when sin grows, it gives Satan a foothold, a place to be in your life. And so if you were to read the parable this way, it would be a warning to you. And we would ask ourselves, what sin am I allowing to be present or to be planted in my life? What is it that I've allowed into my life that is working its way through and is likely to affect every part of my life? What is God calling me to say no to in order to prevent sin from entering and spreading in my life? Another view of this parable uh, is, is that the kingdom of God is not like the preferred religion of the Jews of the day. Jewish religion uh, in Jesus' day had become a, a, a practice of religious observance but not heart change. It was not like heart change. Uh, people would behave one way in the temple and then behave a different way in the marketplace. Some people consider that Jesus was simply saying that his kingdom is not going to be like that, that you can't compartmentalize the kingdom of heaven into just a religious part of your life. If you plant it in your life, it is not made to stay small and contained. Uh, it's not going to grow neatly in the religious row in your garden. It's going to grow and take over. It's meant to. That's what Jesus wants to happen to the kingdom of God. It should affect every area of your life and grow large and dominate. Like the yeast gets all into every part of the dough, 
some people would say this is what Jesus is teaching, that the kingdom of heaven should get into every part of life. I like this idea. Uh, even if even if Jesus wasn't necessarily teaching this, I think it's a useful way to look at the kingdom of heaven and following Jesus. It should affect everything. There is no secular, sacred divide in life. If you read the parable this way, then it's a challenge. Am I trying to keep Jesus only into one part of the garden? Uh, have I planted him and then tried to keep him in a row? Uh, are there areas in my life that I'm trying to keep away uh, from the impact of the gospel? Is Jesus present in church on a Sunday, but not with me at work on a Monday? That would be the challenge. A third view on this parable, and probably the most common view, uh, is that the parable is talking about the growth of God's kingdom. That despite starting from something very small, that it has the power to spread into something really significant. This is consistent with the whole story of the Bible. Uh, if you think about what happens here, uh, God chooses a nation uh, to, to come from a, a childless old couple. Uh, Jesus uh, comes as, as a tiny baby born into very humble circumstances, even though he's king of the universe. Uh, and so the Bible is full of uh, examples where God takes something small and seemingly insignificant and grows it into something very significant. God acts supernaturally to grow his kingdom and it grows because it is his kingdom and that it is his work. And so if you read the parable this way, uh, then it's not a warning, uh, nor is it a challenge. It's an encouragement. Yes, God calls us to sow seeds, but despite the opposition and despite the challenges that are out there, even a very small seed, like a mustard seed, can grow and have a significant impact because it is God's seed. It is God's work. And we saw this truth uh, when we studied the book of Acts together. We saw the unstoppable nature of the gospel. And so this leads us to our key first truth. Uh, in, in this section of Matthew. The growth of God's kingdom is unstoppable. The growth of God's kingdom is unstoppable. This is true both on a personal level and on a global level. When God is at work, no amount of opposition, no amount of uh, resistance is going to prevent him, his plan from coming about. When you and I submit to him, then God will bring about spiritual growth in you, despite the small beginnings, despite the shortcomings uh, in your understanding, despite the small size of your faith. If you think about what Jesus is saying here, he can bring a tree from a tiny mustard seed. And on a spiritual level, he can bring spiritual growth with whatever you're starting with, even if it is as small as a grain of mustard. Next time you're getting the mustard out at home, I want you to have a look at that grain and say, any part of my spiritual life that is this small, God can make it grow. I want to ask you, where are you seeing the power of the gospel in your life like that? What about those people around you? Are you seeing God bring about growth even out of small beginnings? Will you pray for God to continue to grow you and to help you to bring the gospel to others, even if it's from small seeds? Our second division brings us to another pair of parables. And so they, they come in uh, in verses 44 through 46. We skip over the explanation of the parable of the weeds. Phil took us there last week. And we go to the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl. In the parable of the hidden treasure, a man seems to stumble across a treasure hidden in a field. It, the field belongs to somebody else. And as a property lawyer, I know this a basic principle of property law, even today, is that what is in the ground belongs to the person who owns the ground. 
And so in order to own this treasure, this man must first go and own the field. So he goes off and he sells everything he has so that he can engage a property lawyer and purchase the field. I'd love to be this guy's lawyer. What a win. Uh, The message is clear that due to the value of the treasure that he has found, it was worth selling everything that he had in order to obtain the treasure that was buried there. In the parable of the pearl, we see a man who is deliberately searching. This guy doesn't stumble across a pearl. He's out looking for pearls. And when he finds one that has great value, maybe because of its size or its quality, then he goes off and he sells everything that he has in order to buy that pearl. Again, Believe it or not, there are different views about the truth that Jesus is teaching in these parables. And again, I'm glad to say there is room for more than one view. One view of these parables is that you and I are the treasure. You and I are the pearl. And that it was God seeking us, not us seeking God, that results in salvation, in entering the kingdom of heaven. God didn't spare anything to have us, to make a way for you and I to be saved. It is true. God, in fact, gave his own son, Jesus, in order to make a way for us to become his treasured possession. The Bible teaches us this. Now, there are some difficulties with this view. Uh, That's not not a secret, particularly when we look at the parable of the buried treasure. Uh, It doesn't seem to describe someone who's out searching. It seems to describe someone who happened across a treasure. And that doesn't really line up with the searching that the man uh, does when he's looking for pearls. The The man looking for pearls is more like the man looking for the one sheep in Matthew chapter 18. But there is room for this view. And if you read the parable this way, then it speaks to us of the depth of Jesus love. There was no price that was too great to pay in order for him to obtain you as his treasure. He found you and he did everything necessary to make you his own. The other way to read this parable is is that following Jesus is itself the treasure. The kingdom of heaven is the treasure. This aligns well with Matthew chapter 6 about storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven Uh, and Matthew chapter 10 where Jesus sends the disciples out but describes for them the cost of following Jesus but that it's worth it. However you read it, the two parables have this in common. Uh, In both cases, the man recognises the value of what he finds. In both cases, uh, the man determines to have the treasure. He makes a decision that he wants it. He realizes that this treasure can be his and that is exactly what he wants. In both cases, the man goes and sells everything, lets go of every other thing, no matter the cost, they know that it's worth it because of the great value of the treasure that they've found. And in both cases, they go about buying the treasure for themselves. They don't form a company. They don't list a property trust or start a syndicate with their friends. They make a decision to own it for themselves. Now, this is not a message endorsing selfishness. Uh, This is confirming that one does not enter the kingdom of God simply by knowing about the treasure. There must be a deliberate choice to own it for yourself. And if you read the parable this way, then it speaks to us about the superior value of being in Jesus' kingdom. The superior value of being in Jesus' kingdom. Nothing is worth more than Jesus and his kingdom. I find it really interesting to note that the the men in these parables, they did more than just know about the treasure and to know about the pearl. It would be like me knowing about the crown jewels, but they're not mine. These men acted so that they would have the treasure. They took action in response to what they knew. 
They were able to obtain the treasure, and so they did. And so, men, this presents us with a twofold challenge. You can know a book without knowing the author. You can show up to BSF and you can know the Bible without knowing Jesus. For those of you who have never made a decision to follow Jesus, I need to tell you that knowing about the Bible and knowing about Jesus is not the aim of BSF. It is not why we are here. We actually want you to know Jesus. We want you to trust Jesus. We want you to put your life in his hands. If you want to be sure about where you stand with Jesus, then you can ask your group leader for a copy of a booklet called Am I Sure? Am I Sure? Or you can Google it. It's out there in the online world. Uh, just Google BSF Am I Sure? Uh, and have a read of that. It will take you through some questions and some Bible references that will help you to know where you stand on the question of salvation. For those of you who have made a decision to follow Jesus already, then this parable still leaves you with a challenge. It's about acting on what we know. It's about not letting any cost hold us back from following Jesus. Peter Furler sings a great song uh, which me and my family have kind of fallen in love with. It's called, It's All in Your Head. And it has these words. It says, get up, get off your seat, move your feet, just do what he said. It's all in your head. Forgetting what's behind, now's the time to go where you're led. It's all in your head. It's all in your head. Is a challenge. This song is a challenge that following Jesus is not just about knowing him, it's about obeying him. And either way, whether you're yet to meet Jesus for yourself or whether you have chosen to follow him, but yet there's some costs that you're not willing to pay, either way, it leads us to a second key truth for these parables, and that's this. Seeking Jesus' kingdom is more important than anything else in life. Seeking Jesus' kingdom is more important than anything else in life. Now, I'm going to tell you this is easy for me to say and super hard for me to do. I acknowledge that. I'm going to be the first to put up my hand and say, there are things that I don't get right here. I wonder, like me, if there are things that are getting in the way of you seeking first God's kingdom. Maybe you've made statements that you regret and you're too proud to back down. Maybe you treasure your possessions or your expensive lifestyle and that is in the way of you following. Maybe you're happy to study the Bible but it's not really getting to your heart so much. You're not seeing Jesus reflected in your behaviour. Can I ask you, what are you holding on to as treasure? Is it your own life plan? Is it your reputation? Is it your pride? Is it your lifestyle? Is it your job? Is it your recreation, your hobbies, your pleasures? Is it certain relationships or friendships? Is Jesus calling you to place him as a priority in front of any of those things? What, do you, what is Jesus calling you to put aside so that he can be priority number one? Our third division takes us into the response to God's kingdom. Our passage finishes in verses 47 through to 58 with one long parable about the fish and the net, a very short parable about the homeowner having some kind of garage sale, and about Jesus' experience in his own hometown. In each case, this division is talking to us about the response to God's kingdom. The response. In the parable of the fish, we see a lot of parallels here uh, to the parable of the weeds that Phil spoke to us about last week. 
in the parable of the fish and the net, uh, instead of bad, uh, sorry, instead of weeds, we now have bad fish representing people who don't believe. Instead of a harvest, there is a, a dragging in of the net representing the day of judgment. Instead of the angels being harvesters, the angels are now fishermen sorting out the good fish from the bad fish on the day of judgment. And the result from the, for the bad fish is exactly the same as the result for the, wheat, the weeds in the field. They're thrown into a fiery furnace where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This parable is teaching us that everyone must respond to the truth of God's kingdom. Every believer has a responsibility to tell others the truth about God's kingdom. God is the almighty creator of everything. That is the truth of the Bible. And so the entire earth and everything in it is within his control. But what is this thing called God's kingdom? Well, not everyone and in our present day acknowledges Jesus' rightful reign as king. Not everyone surrenders to him. Many people are like that client of mine who was driving with no license. We're happy to live in Victoria, but this guy had no regard for the rules of Victoria. Many of us are happy to live in God's world, but not willing to recognise his loving authority. It is natural for us, because of sin, to want to be the supreme authority of our own lives. We pretend that we can be in control. But like my day, like my my client who was driving unlicensed, there is a judgment day for everyone, and on that day, everyone will recognise who actually is the true king. On that day, it will be too late to change your mind about what kingdom you want to belong to, whether you want to run your own kingdom, or whether you want to believe and be in God's kingdom. Now, for someone who's an unbeliever, reading these words in Matthew about a fiery furnace, about gnashing of teeth, it sounds super harsh. I can understand on one level why people are repelled by this and they say, I don't want it. I'm not interested in a God who is so, so mean and so unloving. I want to challenge you with a different perspective on that question. And so rather than saying that eternal judgment is, is unreasonable and harsh, and I'm, I'm choosing not to follow a God like that, if that's what God is like, I want to ask you a different question. I want you just to imagine for a moment that you're a doctor. Some of you are doctors. Not hard to imagine. But for most of us, that's an imaginary thing. Imagine that you are a doctor and that you've just diagnosed cancer in a patient of yours. They don't know that they've got cancer, but you know. And if you do nothing and you say nothing, then nothing will happen and it's going to be terminal. You know that death is coming towards them. But you know something that they don't know. You also know the treatment. You know exactly what to do in order to treat their cancer. And if that happens, that they will live. So let me now ask you this question. What is the loving thing to do? Would the loving thing to do to be leave them alone in ignorance? To live their life as they choose? You know what will happen to them if you do that. Or would the loving thing be to tell them what's coming? To warn them and to give them an alternative? Would the loving thing to do be to tell them how to avoid certain death? I want to suggest to you that it's a very narrow-minded view of the Bible to say that it is harsh and unloving. Because the truth is that there is a judgment day coming. We are all headed for it. And it will come whether we like it or not, whether we believe in it or not. It is unavoidable. And it would be incredibly unloving for God to leave you alone, to live your life as you choose, 
and to leave you ignorant of your plight. And so he hasn't. He has given us his word. He has placed the church on earth. And he is right now, right here in this lecture, bringing you a reality check. In order to avoid eternal death, the treatment is Jesus Christ. The Bible warns us about judgment because God is loving and he wants you to avoid it. But you must choose to listen and you must choose to act. Which leads us to our last key truth, which we can see in the parable of the fish and we can see in the story of the person who's called to share the treasure that they have at home and we can see in the reality of the people who responded to Jesus when he went to his hometown that we are all called to respond to and then to share the truth of Christ's kingdom. We are all called to respond to and then to share the truth of Christ's kingdom. And so I want to ask you this. What is stopping you from responding? If you have never responded to the truth of Christ's kingdom, what is stopping you? You've now heard the warning. You now know the treatment. Now the choice is yours. If you have questions, if you have doubts, please talk to someone. Don't leave this question unanswered. Saying nothing is saying no. If you've already made that choice, I want to ask you, what is stopping you from sharing? What is stopping you from sharing the truth of Christ's kingdom? Let's pray together as we close. Lord God, what a, what a convicting passage. What a hard reality it is to face. And yet, uh, in your grace and in your mercy, you give us warning. You give us time. Uh, Lord, you have uh, placed us here in, in this age uh, before the judgment day when we have an opportunity to respond to the truth of your kingdom. God, I pray that we would not ignore it, uh, that we would not pretend that it's not real. God, I pray that uh, we would uh, both respond to it and share it with others out of love. Lord, thank you that you, you came, you made a way for us to become your treasured possession. Lord, I pray that even today that we would respond to that reality. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I really appreciate you being with us. God bless over the break. Uh, have a look at the MyBSF website. Uh, but above all, uh, have a think about those challenges that come from this passage. God bless. Look forward to seeing you in 2022. Have a happy and a safe Christmas, and we'll see you again soon.